Good morning, ladles and jelly spoons. Um, wow, the lighting's weird. That's better. Today I'm going to do a video on how I dress the hammer faces on the, the cheap hammers I buy. Uh, right now I don't have, you know, 150, 120, 100 bucks to spend on a, a custom made hammer. Uh, I've got billets to make my own hammers from. That being said, it's uh, like 1215. It's not really a known steel for hammer making, and I can't find information on heat treating it. So, odds are good those are going to be an absolute failure, but it'll be worth trying and they'll look cool until they break. Um, so, what I'm going to start with is I bought these two from Harbor Freight to finish off the Hammers I Want from Harbor Freight collection. This is a four pound stubby, this is a two and a half pound. Uh, my brother got the two and a half pound the last time we went out to Harbor Freight to get him set up I saw it and was like I thought it was a two pounder So I didn't think much until I started facing his off and was like, oh, this is two and a half pounds. Okay This just gives me a weight. I don't have you know because I, I like to when my arm starts giving out I like to step down incrementally from three to two to 40 ounce uh, or vice versa and I'll kind of rotate hammers as my arm gets tired and uh, so I can keep going and build my arm up better. The four pounder, um, those are a recent addition to my Harbor Freight and with it being a stubby handle I can control it better and I figure starting to do a few heats with this every, uh, every session should help build my arm up a bit faster because now I can swing the three pound as long as I want without worrying about a thing. So uh, what I'll do is I'll take this four pounder here and this two pounder and dress both simultaneously but I'm not gonna make y'all sit through both of them I'm gonna focus the video on the four pounder but the hammer dressing process is the same for each one what will happen is I will start on the first grit I'm gonna start with 36 grit and shape this one out as a round flat this will also be a round flat but I'm not gonna make you watch this one because it's the same thing this is the same process for making a round flat out of all your Harbor Freight drilling and engineers hammers and uh, once I've done 36 grit, I'm going to turn the camera off and go through the rest of them because, again, boring, and uh, come back when it's time for the buffer. Now, uh, if you try this yourself, one thing you'll notice is off of the 36, the uh, 60 or 80, the 120, the 220, and give or take into about the 320, the, the faces will look kind of rough, especially the round face. It's going to look kind of rough, a little bit... Uh, mangled you're not going to get it a nice smooth dome until you get into the higher grits i chased my brother's two and a half pound hammer until i was like that far into that recess right there with the weight on it it no longer has the number two on there <laughs> i said the number two and uh but that's just from chasing that so far trying to get a smooth domed face on that hammer on the low grits i messed up so uh, I'm going to stop this right here, and this is going to be respirator work because these things generate a lot of fine powder that gets all over and into everything. Um, today I don't feel like inhaling it. And I'm also going to wear gloves because, again, the fine powder gets all over everything, and I don't want everything, I don't want it covering everything I touch. So I will stop this here. I will reset the camera. We'll get started, and I will show you the process, the full grind, uh, the round and flat and uh, a side note the you're gonna have to find your own solutions if you don't have a proper 2x72 like your 1x30 you should be able to remove the platen somehow and, and make some slack belt on there which you're def desperately gonna want um, you have a 4x36 you can use the wheel on the end the, the roller as a contact wheel to do your flat face um, your front face or your round face you're going to have to probably work that over on the flat and, and just round the face out as much as you can and go back with a hand sander or a palm sander with a spongy attachment on it to get that job done. But uh, where there's a will, there's a way. And there are many ways to do this. This is just the way I do it. Not necessarily the best way, just the way I've found. So uh, back in a minute. <laughs>
Okay, so the hammer faces are, uh, they, the grinding is done. I ran them up to 800 grit. Let me grab them. I forgot to pick them up before I started recording. Because I got the dumb. Okay, so there we are on that face. So you can see it's nice and round and domed over. And this face, and for some reason the flat faces always show more grind marks than the round sides. But I've also softened this edge up to where it's a nice gentle radius. There are no sharp edges so it doesn't mar the work nearly as badly. If you get out of control with it and you come in and you know you strike more like this than like this, you're gonna you're gonna see a mark. Um, and something else that I do while I'm grinding these on uh, this face is to figure out whether or not it's rounded or centered. I'll take it and I'll set it on a flat surface like my anvil and just let it roll around a little bit. You'll feel a flat spot. You will. Um, it'll be noticeable. And you can set it like this and uh, see if it'll stand on its own on your anvil or at least close to it and rock it around and feel whether or not that's flat. It really helps. But uh, I get a lot of questions about how I buff things. So, I'm going to show you what I do. Um, I went to Harbor Freight. I got these four inch buffing wheels and this compound. I've got black, gray, green, and white. Each one of these gets its own wheel and the black and gray are both marked because they look identical pretty much after you get some wear on them. Uh, the green one, I don't worry about so much because black and gray are marked. This one doesn't need it. And this is the largest wheel for the white I've got because I haven't bought more wheels yet. Um, these are going to be due up for replacement soon. When you mark these, go front and back on both of them so you minimize your chances of confusion. Because if you, if you do something and uh, accidentally put black compound on your gray wheel, congratulations, you now have a second black wheel. Uh, you can't really mix the uh, compounds up on here like you can put gray on the black wheel um, You can put finer compounds on the coarser wheels It's not gonna hurt anything, but if you put a coarse compound on a fine wheel You now have a coarse wheel um, There's no getting it back out so uh, I'm gonna set this up and uh, You can do this with a drill press you can do this with a, a hand drill um, you know, or whatever means you have, the only caveat to that is the faster it is, the better. It is important to have a significant amount of velocity when you're doing this, or it's not gonna cut nearly as deeply. Like on my drill press, yes, it will polish, but no, it will, nowhere, it will be nowhere near as good as the big guy here does. So uh, take that into consideration when you're doing yours, um, and just be aware that that's the best you can, and honestly, you don't have to take this past 800. You don't even have to take it past 400. But, you know, for me, once I hit 400, the next uh, six, 600 and 800 grits, they go by like in 40 seconds a pop, basically. They take no time. So for the extra time, I'll go ahead and get the best finish I can. And because it makes me happy and I like seeing the mirrored finishes, I'll go ahead and buff them. Doesn't take long. So, uh... Let's get this set up and ready to rock and or roll. Now I'll set these off to the side on this shelf here within easy reach so it doesn't take much time to swap them out. Um, the easier it is to keep these things organized and done in the right order, the better. It helps eliminate confusion, helps prevent you from forgetting where you are in the process. And it's another step to help prevent you from accidentally putting black compound on your green wheel. So I'll chuck this up in here, I'll drop my black compound, and I'm just going to do the black compound and show you what it looks like after that. I'm not going to make you sit through all four compounds, and then we'll come back at the end for a little recap, and I'll show you what they look like after they got some use on them, because I get, I, I get questions about that. And you don't have to put absurd amounts of compound on your wheel either. Um, I have this much black left of this tube. 
from learning that lesson the hard way. But it's like a $5 stick of compound, so no big loss. Alright, that's where I am after the black compound. Um, this is not quite as shiny as the camera's making it look. What the black compound does so far from what I can tell is prepare it for the gray compound and then that's when the real shine starts showing up. And then of course the green and white are just to brighten up the finish um, so that it reflects light a lot better and looks cooler. Um, as I said, at this point, this is just to make me happy. So uh, I will come back after all the buffing is done, we'll take a look at it, and uh, I will wrap the video up. Okay, the buffing is now wrapped up. These hammers are as finished as I'm good and well going to get them. And uh, here's the four pounder, and this is what we got out of it. We've got a nice, clean, high gloss finish. You can see the Grizzly 2x72 right there. and. I got the best finish on the flat face that I've gotten to date, but that's part of because I have made a point of trying to make it better every time I do one of these. Uh, not necessarily because I think a super high mirror finish is necessary on a hammer like this. It's just good practice on something that is kind of inconsequential if I get it wrong. Um, there's still some very faint hazing and a few lines floating around here and there, but nothing major. And given what this thing's about to be put through, not a big deal. I think uh, a little bit later on today or tomorrow, I'm going to get a rag and some acetone, clean all the stickers off this one, and uh, all my other Harb and or Freight hammers. Uh, here's the two and a half pounder. Again, I got a spectacular mirror on the flat face, which surprised me very greatly. And this one also came out super clean. You know, as always, very, very faint lines here and there, little tiny bits of hazing, things like that, but I'm not worried about it. Uh, and I, I do get a lot of questions about how these look like after a while. And, uh, you know, here's the flat face after working on some, uh, some Damascus and stuff like that with it. You can see the flux uh, adhered to the surface. Uh, this side has definitely seen its fair share of use. And, uh, yeah, you can kind of see what's going on there, but I can't really get this effectively shielded. Um, 
yeah, you can see where it's no longer a mirror in there. And uh, that's not a big deal. I knew that was going to happen. I um, wasn't really worried about that. Honestly, I just wanted really good pictures to throw on Facebook, and I also wanted the finish to stay as smooth as possible for as long as possible, and resist corrosion for as long as possible, and I think I've accomplished that. Um, you know, and they, they do a great job. And uh, something else to point out, because there are a lot of guys that, you know, much like me, when I first uh, started blacksmithing, um, when I bought my grinder and my Atlas Mini, all that stuff, about four years ago, um, during the three or four weeks I was able to use it before it had to get packed back up again and wait for another four years to get used, um, I bought actually this. First hammer I bought for smithing. I love this hammer. But I didn't bother doing anything to this face. And when you buy these from like Harbor Freight, Home Depot, Ace, anything that's a drilling hammer or an engineer's hammer or anything like that, it's going to come with a nice sharp edge around here. It is quite sharp. If you do not deal with that, you are going to put huge gouges in your work. It's going to be like a giant thumbnail just went and it's going to take forever to get rid of that because, you know, you can always, like, take metal away, but you can't put it back on. You can't really fill that back in. You know, if, if you want that fixed, you kind of have to squish everything flat and then upset it back into a brick so you can start over again. Um, so, if you don't have enough of a shop or you don't have the desire to create the, uh, the round flat face, do yourself a favor, soften these edges up as much as possible. Make it a soft, smooth, radius curve. Um, the, the softer and more gentle the curve, the better. The less it's going to ding your work up while you're hammering on it. Let me do the research for you. I have made a lot of nasty looking work before I figured that out. Um, and uh, yeah, like you can do this with pretty much any variety of sander you got. I mean. The uh, 3 by 21 floor sander will work just fine. Um, you won't have a slack belt on it. Uh, 4 by 36 will work. No slack belt though, so you have to find a way around that, which is going to be working it on that platen and just rolling it around and creating the rough surface, the rough rounded surface. And then coming back and hand sanding this until it's smooth, and that may take a little while, but the upshot is you're just palming the sandpaper instead of trying to work a flat surface. So you can really sit there and just work on it and work on it and work on it while you're watching YouTube, something like that. You don't have to stare at what you're doing. You'll feel when it's round and the inside of your hand will make the perfect cup for sanding one of these down. Um, now, it, if you haven't been doing this for long, the, uh, the round flat face is great. Um, I find it to be a wonderful thing now that I have them. I only did my first round flats the day of the... Uh, first attempt at Damascus live feed um, and that round face does a great job of squishing metal without you know digging in and creating chop marks that a, a cross peen will do um, it's much gentler it does a lot for me and honestly I don't have the hang of using a cross peen yet I haven't gotten good results with it I need to practice that but I haven't really felt the need to have to practice because what I'm doing already works well for me I'm comfortable with it and I don't have complaints about my process I'm sure that will change given time, um, but that's all I got before I am talking just to hear myself speak. Um, so please, if you guys are in your shop today, stay safe. Um, remember, like, treat all the equipment in your shop like it is actively trying to hurt you because it is your job to prevent them from doing that. 100% your job to prevent that from happening. Uh, that's how I was taught by my uncle when I was a kid, and it has served me well. Every time I ignore it, I get comfortable, and then something happens. Chunks of fingernail disappear. Uh, I think uh, I think it combined alcohol and making a crude spear out of mild steel and a wooden dowel from Home Depot. And uh, it slipped, and somewhere here I've got where a bench grinder took a nice deep bite out of the back of one of my knuckles, and that hurt. That hurt, and it was packed with nastiness. So yeah, um... You know, I, I will do everything I can to stay on safety and remind people, stay safe. Alright, um, the inconvenience of stopping to find your protective equipment is nothing 
compared to the inconvenience of losing half a finger or an eye or something like that. Uh, make sure you're doing it safely. Um, even if you're doing it full time and you have to go as fast as possible, you ain't gonna do no more work with half your hand missing. At least not for a while. So uh, until next time, praise the forge, pass the borax, and also to all the people that have subscribed recently, Thank you very much. Um, it is very humbling that people are subscribing and finding something useful here. Um, I couldn't be happier about it, and uh, I definitely appreciate it, everything. Um, and I haven't done a Patreon account. I haven't done uh, t-shirts yet. Those are coming, but I would like to get other parts of this thing set up first. And honestly, I'm not in a position where I feel like my needs are so desperate or, or so expensive yet that I have to worry about a Patreon account. Um, but when I do set one up, one thing I will be doing at the end of every month um, is going to be a breakdown of what dollar for dollar was spent from that Patreon money. And uh, I will be planning on at least one giveaway with some of the Patreon money, either buying the supplies to make something or buying a really cool tool that uh, you know somebody would like to have in their shop, just something like that to give back. Um, you know, it, it. I'm weird about stuff like that. Like going through my uncle's stuff when he passed away very suddenly, I felt so dirty going through his tools and rounding up whatever I was comfortable taking home. I wish I hadn't because I could have gotten enough tools to fill my shop and work almost exclusively with his tools doing all this. And uh, that would have felt amazing now, but that's the same thing with Patreon. That's part of why I don't ask for handouts on forging it forward. Um, I am in no position to say I need anything badly enough for someone to give it to me that could have gone to somebody else that has next to nothing to work with. I am 100% cognizant of the fact that I have more than enough shop to turn out very, very, very high quality work without adding any more equipment right now it's up to me to develop the skills to do that. The equipment's already there. Um, so, again, that's what I got. Till next time, praise the forge, pass the borax. Thank you very much. Stay safe.